I'm really excited to have the next group, next team up with us today, um, who is the team behind Gay Mean Girls. Um, I'm going to read their bios and then I'm going to introduce them to the stage. <clears throat> Uh, Haley Wong is an emerging cinematographer who graduated from Ryerson University's Film Studies program. Um, she is passionate about collaborating with storytellers to shoot underrepresented subjects in mainstream media. Her current body of work includes multiple queer and women-led filmmakers' films, including uh, Gay Mean Girls, Earth to Avery, Joy, Aaron Guides, Aaron's Guide to Kissing Girls, and the documentary Slut or Nut. Uh, Haley hopes to inspire other queer women of color to get behind the camera and exp express themselves through cinema. Uh, Haisha Zhang is a Chinese-Canadian award-winning filmmaker. She studied film at Ryerson University, in which she was the co-founder and president of the Ryerson Alliance of Women Filmmakers. Haisha's work often examines the politics of identity and the influence of beauty. Uh, Madison Fell is uh, currently the development manager at Gearshift Films. Before taking this role, she worked uh, in business affairs on television shows like Hockey Wives, NHL Revealed, and Working Mums. Uh, Madison graduated from Ryerson School of Image Arts, uh, where she was a winner of the Norman Jew Jewison Award, as well as the HSBC Filmmaker Award. Uh, all three have worked on the viral short Gay Mean Girls, which has garnered uh, 3.4 million views on YouTube. Um, and they are here to tell us about its expansion into a web series. Uh, please join me in welcoming Haisha, Haley, and Madison to the stage. So maybe, Hayushi, you can start by um, telling us a little bit about the uh, um, Gaming Girls and um, you know what it's about, and if you could give us a short pitch for people who aren't familiar with it. Um, so this is going to sound like I've done it a million times, and it's because I have. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> Gaming Girls is a coming-of-age dramedy that follows Lucy, Ki no, Lucy Ching, prom committee member as she seeks to establish gay prom royalty in an attempt to charm her best friend Miranda, an out, les no, yep, an out lesbian YouTuber on the internet. Great. Um, so you started with the short, obviously, and um, you evolved into making it a web series. Um, and if you guys can speak to a little bit how you decided that the web series was the next format that you wanted to explore and the next iteration of Gay Mean Girls. Um, so, um, uh, it's mostly for our audience, um, which consists of, like, uh, queer kids of color. Um, and I think it's, like, the internet is the most accessible way for them to consume information and to consume media. Um, and so it just made sense for it to be on the web. I think as well, um, with the way that the ideas of the short film um, needed to expand. Um, having it in an episodic format also made the most sense. Can you speak a little bit to like how it's different writing for a web series versus a short film? And also, Haley, if you can speak to how it's different maybe shooting uh, a web series versus a short film. <clears throat> yeah, so... Um, on the short film, I wrote it on my own. Um, and uh, I wrote it in film school. Um, and so, like, there were, like, screenwriting classes and stuff that I would, like, workshop the script in. But for the web series, um, so one of my goals is to write for television. And so working on this project like allowed me to um, take that opportunity to work in a writer's room format. Um, and um, I guess like for anyone who hasn't done it before, it was like, I don't think I've ever used my brain as hard as I did in a writer's room. Um, it was like one of the most like exhilarating but also exhausting things that I've ever done. And I think at this stage of the project, it was like probably one of my favorite parts of um, the production. Um, so um, the way that we worked for um, the writer's room was that there were um, three other writers 
um, and they were all queer women of color with a senior story editor as well as a non-binary consultant. Um, and so we met for, I think, three or four weekends, um, working from 10 to 6, where we would break the story um, using, like, cue cards and stuff. And so it was very much, like, a TV-style way of writing. Um, and so kind of what I learned is that in every episode you have to like the audience needs to learn something new about the character and in every scene there has to be a turn in like the character's relationship with each other and so I think that um, in that sense um, we were able to expand like the concepts in a way that was really smooth and um, in a way where like it was easy to um, create cliffhangers for the next episode, which is kind of what you want for like a YouTube format, which is where it's being released. And in terms of shooting the project, are there things that you were aware of in particular because you were shooting it in a web series format? Um, it was like the hardest thing I've ever shot in my life because this is like the longest thing. And it was like 15 days and like I've mainly shot shorts. And when you shoot like a short, you can be like super precious with your cinematography. You can be like, we're gonna spend like like four hours lighting this and like, it's gonna look perfect. But then, cause you're shooting like two to three pages a day. But we were shooting like, like seven to eight pages a day. So I kind of had to be like, I just suck it up a little bit. Um, <laughs> a lot. Um, and it was very difficult. We also like block shot it which was easier for me, but we were super like dictated by our locations. So we would shoot like episode one and then the next scene would be like episode eight. And it was like, that part was probably really hard for you and the actors. It was easier for me though, so. Um, I would compare like short film filmmaking. It's like sprinting versus a marathon. For me, um, I knew that if I tried to push myself to 100 every day, I would crash. Like, I would have 100 one day, zero another day, 100 one day, zero another day. So I kept myself at a steady 70. Um, and I had to, like, have enough confidence in myself to know that whatever 20% is missing are, like, they're there for me, not necessarily for the audience. The audience, like, I'm a... I'm a good enough filmmaker that that 70% has to be enough. Um, and I think as well, um, for the actors, it was really hard. Um, for most of them, it was like, or for the lead, it was her first time acting in like anything. She hadn't even been in a short before. Um, and so one of the things with block shooting is that as Haley was saying, like you're jumping from one to eight and the growth that the main character kind of goes through is pretty drastic. And so what I would do to kind of mitigate the like confusion that even I would feel like not knowing where the character was emotionally in a certain scene was that I would ask her to play it several different times in each different take. So that, for example, like if she was like more confident by episode five, but I didn't know exactly how confident she needed to have been, I would ask her to play it like really meek in the first take, super like exaggerated in the second take so that in the edit room we would have something to work with. And Madison, if you can talk a little bit about how you guys funded this project and got it off the ground. Yeah, so we got um, funding from two different bodies. The first one was the Telefilm Talent to Watch Fund, which we submitted to and had the short, which we, I believe, needed to be eligible for Talent to Watch. But none of us had done a really large project before, so we were still eligible for that Um that funding and then once we got that we had an application in for the bell fund as well and getting the talent to watch funding sort of triggered getting the bell fund funding so we had the two that we combined um and that goes towards both the production of the project and the distribution and launch of the series but those applications are incredibly incredibly time consuming so if you're going to go down that road you have to be prepared to to know you know where you're at and what you're doing and what you're telling them you can do because it took us like a hundred hours to get that money. <laughs> it wasn't, it's a huge undertaking just applying. Oh. 
Um, I also think as well, like um, timing plays a big part in us getting the the grants. Um, Cause um, so I made this short in 2013, and like back in back in that time, it wasn't like cool to be a social justice warrior. And so um, the the response that like we had from like institutions with like money and power was really really negative. Um, whereas like now because like uh, for telefilms talent to watch like you have to go through like one of those institutions to get that money. Our institution was Ryerson and like our props who like sneered at us for like making the short was all like raw raw like women like <laughs> queer people blah blah and so um like if we had applied so we tried to get money for this in 2016 and that mm-hmm. didn't go through and so I think because of the like political movements that are happening now um that also played a big part of it there are more opportunities for young people to be able to access funding and now People were just more receptive to it, like this project in general, I think, than they than they were before. I know you guys talked about how it was you did block shooting days. If you can talk a little bit about what your production schedule looked like for gaming gaming girls. I would like to add that Rebecca was our first AD and she kicked ass because it was so hard. And there'd be some days at lunch where we were all looking at each other like, what who how are we gonna what was the plan here? Like it was, it was, it was, and block, like we doing a web series. I think there's also so many locations because every episode had sort of different things going on. You follow this format. Um, a high school was a big part of it. So we can only shoot on the weekends in the high school for certain periods of time. So everything that took place there had to happen on the weekend, which shifted our shoot to be Wednesday to Sunday. And then Monday and Tuesday were off. Um, so that was a little challenging, just kind of getting everybody on the same page and getting a flow. But uh, from a production standpoint, once we got the block shooting sort of figured out, and we knew what the schedule was. It was easy to stick to s- stick to it because it was so dictated by the locations. It was just a matter of keeping up creatively that was challenging. And what we would cut if we had to cut something or what we would compromise when that when that time came and it did come. Because 15 days is not that long to shoot, like, 90 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, it was hard. And so, you, I mean, that was one of the hardest parts of the shoot for you, obviously. Um, what was another challenging part that you guys experienced in shooting the project? Um, like, when you shoot anything, you can, like, be, like, super prepared. But no matter what, like, something's going to go wrong, like... You know, like you're going to be outside and shooting and it's sunny and then like two seconds later, it's like raining or you're outside and then like you're by a school, but it's not running and the fire alarm goes off for like 30 minutes. And all the kids come out and they start talking and talking and talking and they won't go back inside. And then you have to sit there for 20 minutes until they're. But we, for example, we had one night that we were going to shoot the two leads on a swing and they're in their prom attire and it was like kind of starting to snow. Everyone was exhausted. The, our lead actress was just like burnt out that day. And so we set up the whole shot. We put like two crew members on the swings to see how it looks. Looked like a horror film, wasn't working. And we had to cut it that day and it was horrible. I cried at cutting it, like it was so bad. But sometimes you're like, if we shoot this, first of all, they're gonna get colds. Second of all, it's we're not gonna get what you want. Like you do have to weigh it in the moment. That was, that was a rough day. <laughs> It's hard. <laughs> I think we have a clip from Gaming Girls. If we can cue that up, that took her a while to get all those words out. It was <laughs> it took a few tries. How did you guys find the actors? Uh, oh, so Miranda, we found through Tiff Next Wave. Um, uh, Bridget did a post um, for us for the casting, so that was really nice. Um, so they're all um, non-union, and um, so. There's five, it's like, yeah, so there's five actors, like five main characters. Miranda, we found through Tiff Next Wave. Um, Clara, who you saw like a flash of at the beginning, um, she she was through like Mandy, I think. Um, the Anita, the black girl in it, uh, was, um, she went to my old high school, and so I like, knew her and also because she's like a act like a real actor um and so i think like her agent submitted her and then 
Um, Jamie, I, I knew because uh, they uh, the, there's a non-binary character. Their name is Jamie. And I, um, I knew them from like my old high school. They were in the GSA at the time. They were cis. Uh, and so I emailed them asking if they wanted to audition for Lucy. And they were like, no, uh, I have school. But uh, my time commitments, like I see that there's a non-binary character. I'm, I'm interested in auditioning for that. And I was like, sure. And then Lucy was um, a was really hard so so lucy was last um i think everyone every other character we auditioned maybe around like 10 people but for lucy it was like 40 we looked everywhere for lucy yeah um and lucy we found actually through casting workbook like we got someone's like login <laughs> and i looked up every single asian actor who is like under 22 and we contacted all of them who are non-union and she showed up through that and we did a lot of callbacks though like it wasn't sort of right off the bat we we had her read with Miranda and some of the other characters because carrying the entire series was a lot to put on this this one person so we did try and stress test it kind of as much as we could but um, if you guys can share some advice um, for young filmmakers in the audience who are interested in web series and um, some advice for, for folks for getting into that format. Um, I think because web, web series is such a new like medium, there's not really like a legacy of convention that you can look to to see what you should break or stick with. Um, so I think also like... Um, uh, you um, sorry. So I think defining success for yourself and what that means to you is really important because I think it's hard to lead without a vision. And when I talk about vision, it's not just your artist your artistic vision that goes up there. It's like um, your vision of what su success looks like to you and where you want your career to go. Um, so I think taking the time to define that for yourself like in general, I think too, but especially for like a new medium like web series. I think also um, web is like public, like people can see when you fail, um, like your numbers and stuff are all online. And like, I'm, I'm personally not super proud of the short film, but it's like there, like, and it has like 3.5 million views and I cannot like escape that. Um, and when it first went viral, it like ruined my life in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think like to prepare for, for that and like the kind of visibility it might bring into your life, I think um, like those things I couldn't prepare for at the time. I think also knowing like why you're doing a web series, because some people we would talk to, it seemed, it seemed like they thought we were kind of chopping up a feature into eight chunks and there's it's so different from that and the way you distribute it is different the way the audience finds it is different the things that matter as far as your launch goes are different so why you're doing that and how that services your audience needs to be really clear because sometimes a feature might be the better option and doing the festival run and it might work better for your career trajectory but that it just didn't make sense here but I would I don't know if I would just do a web series because kind of you just want to to think about what makes the most sense for the show or the project or the features is really important because it's not just a chopped up feature. It's like different. <laughs> when you guys decided to go the web series route, did you do a lot of research on other um, web series that were out there and seek inspiration from those? I think now we're doing a lot too because the launch is different for us because we don't have a like internet personality as the lead. A lot of web series have someone who is either a big on YouTube or they have a big online presence and that that doesn't really exist for us. So we're looking at a lot of different web series and how they launched and how they kind of went about it and what we can take from that. Um, but I know Heishi looked at tons of web series prior to us writing this and kind of doing this whole thing <laughs> um yes are there some that stand out there's one called an emmy for megan and the web series is literally like um this like tv show writer campaigning for an emmy because she found a loophole in the emmy like 
rules where as long as you like release it before a certain date and as long as all the episodes are under 16 minutes like you can you're eligible for an emmy and so like that was the whole premise of the show um uh megan amram is the is the name of the star and she's like twitter famous um so i like that a lot i um there's one called don't hug me i'm scared which was like viral back in the day and it's like puppets um uh and it's quite like grotesque and i like that um um and there's one called i put the bi in bitter which is like very um wholesome it's about like a girl in high school she's queer and asian too and um she like realizes that she's like bisexual and like wears a lot of denim jackets (laughs) um and like they they make use of emojis in like a really interesting way um i i think seeing like how people experiment with the format and like the kind of um, innovations that they're bringing into like this narrative is really interesting. We're almost out of time, but I want to give you guys a chance if you have any last advice that you'd want to share for uh, young creators who are kind of starting out in the industry. Um, I think who you like work with is super important. Um, Like we, I think we're like a pretty good unit team. Um, and like we worked really, really hard, um, but we also were like there for each other on like a personal level too. Like we would check in because like if one of us failed, like we all would fail. So I think you really need to find people that you can work creatively with, but also like work professionally with. And it's also nice if you're like friends and you care about each other because I think a lot of the time like egos get in the way and we were able to like not let that happen. Yeah, keeping keeping the relationship healthy was like priority number. I don't know what we would have done if something had been going on between the three of us and you know, when it came to do time to do production and really get into it like we really did kind of abandon all else, everything else in our lives, except for making sure that the three of us were good and the project was being serviced. Like when it came time to do it, it was it was like a conscious decision to, yeah, support each other and be honest with each other, but never be hard on each other or do something that would just end up being completely unproductive. Aisha, do you want to add anything? <laughs> I think um, taking risks that feel important to you and doing what scares you um, is important. I think even if it fails, it means that you've grown. And I think like for, especially if you're a marginalized filmmaker and you get like opportunities like this, where it's like, this is like the most money I've ever like, like had for a project and it feels like I will never get anything any bigger than this for the rest of my life because it feels so big but I think it's important to keep in perspective that um this is a part of a journey that you go on and allowing yourself to take risks and um and and to be scared and do what you're afraid of I think um like even if you fail now, it'll help you later. That's great advice. I want to thank all of you guys for being here and sharing your journeys with us. Um, And we have another panel coming up afterwards, so stay tuned. (laughs)